So um, that said, and as I said, I'm going to go over some other course logistics at the end of this. So let's think for a second of what comparative politics actually is. And I have two um, kind of definitions that go along the same lines. So the first one is from Viarda, and Viarda points out that comparative politics always involves systematic comparisons. We're going to think about what that means in a couple of slides. Um, and it's comparisons between political systems. That might be trivial, but anyway, that's what we're concentrating on. We're not looking at entire societies, we're not looking at economies, we're looking principally at political systems. And we seek to explain both similarities and differences. So why are some things similar elsewhere and why, are, why do other systems do things differently? And in contrast to what a journalist would do in sort of single case studies or also a political scientist would do in a single case study, we are always interested in patterns. So we're less interested in any one particular country with a little parentheses around that, we're more interested in patterns, similarities, different uh, differences and regularities across countries. So um, if you're a comparative politics person, you might be, I mean, you might be an expert in British politics, but you're not only looking at British politics. Your, your job would be to compare British politics to politics elsewhere. That's what would separate you from someone who exclusively studies Britain. Now, Lane offers uh, a slightly uh, different take on this and also points to an important distinction and I'm going to reinforce in a slide. Um, comparative politics is both a world, meaning a, a set of empirical phenomena, and a discipline, so a particular way of looking at the world from a political science kind of perspective. So comparative politics, one, encompasses all these political processes and institutions, all the political behavior that we see around the world and the similarities and differences between it. And the discipline are those poor, poor people that try to keep up with all these similarities, differences, and changes over time. Because obviously, once we've understood two political systems and compared them, there's no guarantee that this stuff will stay like this forever. There's obviously changes happening. Things can get more similar, less similar over time, uh, and it will it requires us to continuously compare political systems to kind of come up with good answers to our questions. So we seek to understand, explain, and maybe, maybe influence the, the world of politics through the comparative methods. On the last couple of slides, we're going to think about maybe how this kind of influence could look like that we can exert here. So Comparative politics, you might or might not be aware, of course, that political science is a big discipline. And it has sub-disciplines, even though some disciplines like to pretend they're their own thing. International relations, for example, uh, likes to believe that it's not part of political science. I have no problem with saying that it is. Um, anyway, I know that some of you are studying different degree programs, so maybe this comes as a shock to you that maybe these, these things are not all that different. But so there's, of course, several subdisciplines, international relations being one of them and comparative politics being another. There's also political theory, public policy analysts that, that have their own set of theories, assumptions and phenomena in the world that they're trying to explain. Um, so comparative politics is a big slice of political science that you're getting served here in this particular lecture and the accompanying tutorials. What sets comparative politics apart from the other um, uh, sub-disciplines is that territory or political territory plays a large role. We think that many, many differences and similarities are explained when you uh, think about particular things happening in certain territories differently from other territories around the world. Again, this is not something that will come as a huge uh, surprise to you. So territory is the unit of analysis here normally. So country A versus country B. Um, and the variation between them is normally what we're trying to explain. Why does Britain do things so differently than Norway? Or why does Norway do things so differently than Denmark? And so on. And we normally try to focus on interactions within political systems. So if we try to explain why uh, Denmark and the UK have different sort of policy outcomes, we are normally looking inside those systems. We're not really looking at interactions between these systems because that's the IR scholars' jobs. So IR scholars would look at, well, how do Britain and Denmark interact on the international level? While comparativists would explain, well, why does Britain act this way? Why does Denmark act this way? And why do they act differently? There doesn't have to be lots of interaction happening. In many cases, you can compare countries that in practice don't have much interaction happening at all. 
I mean, you can compare Botswana and Nauru. Those don't have, as far to, to my knowledge at least, not the most extensive diplomatic connections, right? But you can still compare them. So this is both a field of inquiry, we want to compare political systems, and a method of inquiry, we want to use comparison as a method rather than single case studies or other ways to think about political systems. So the comparative method then means it's not, uh, nothing more than an analytical effort to exploit similarities and differences across systems. Um, and our job is in all of this to develop theory, meaning we want to come up with hypotheses, so assumptions about how the world works. We think that a particular thing happens because of something else. We want to infer causality, something causes something else, and we want to produce generalizations. Presidential systems always do this. Parliamentary systems always do that. Majoritarian systems always do this. Proportional systems always do that, and so on and so forth. Countries with female defense ministers always do this. Countries with male defense ministers always do the other thing, and so on. So in a, in a huge variety of categories, of course, you can make these. And we're going on Thursday to be talking about how to uh, employ the arsenal that we have already, employing theory, uh, uh, hypotheses, causalities, assumptions, and so on. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples on Thursday how this can look in um, uh, actual real life uh, political science studies. So, and the way that you apply the comparative method to different problems very much depends on what you are trying to find out. And again, this is going to be um, something that you will notice comes out in all the lectures uh, because depending on what their topic is and depending on what they want to find out, they all use slightly different ways uh, of the comparative method. Uh, one simple example is, are you comparing lots of countries that are very, very similar, but that are dissimilar in one particular aspect? So lots and lots of democracies, for example, or Western democracies, but one of those democracies is much, much fairer than the others, right? That would be one way of doing that. Or are you comparing countries that are really, really dissimilar, but that have the same outcomes, for example? You see lots and lots of countries that have huge inequality, despite their very different political systems. So there's a few different ways that you can apply the comparative, employ the comparative method to come up with good answers to your questions. So um, there's a few different things that the comparative method can give us that other methods don't. So the first thing is, uh, it stems from the realization that whenever we characterize anything, it is always in relation to other things. Um, now, this, is, uh, this normally results in a, uh, I'm an insufferable know-it-all, if you haven't already noticed that. Um, and uh, one of the games I like to play with my friends or my wife is a game called, well, in relation to what? Uh, I invite you to play this with your friends too. Whenever someone talks about just about anything about the world, like, wow, um, uh, I'm really poor this week. You can ask, like, well, in relation to what? And of course, you will notice fairly quickly that, well, yeah, you're certainly poor in terms of someone living in Edinburgh poor, but you are most certainly not poor compared to, say, someone in a developing country being poor, right? You know that, of course. Um, my wife has this uh, slight addiction to reading police reports uh, online. The police always helpfully puts out police reports where they note, like, where in the, where in the city something has happened. And she keeps um, telling me about, oh, all this stuff going on in Edinburgh. Well, in relation to what? So, like, is Edinburgh a violent city? Well, I don't know, maybe more violent than if you moved out into the country for 20 miles. Uh, it's certainly not more violent than Chicago, right? Or Honduras, or some other place you could pick. So, um, uh, and you can employ this game also in your, uh, in your normal everyday conversation. So you keep, you, I'm, I'm sure you've heard people say, well, my God, this thing with, with Trump, for example, in the US, this is no doubt, this is the darkest possible timeline that we're in here. Uh, it can't be any worse. Well, and then you would ask, well, in relation to what? Have you looked at Watergate, for example? How did that work out? Like how, how deep in the, I would have almost said shitter, how deep in trouble, uh, how deep in trouble were we then, right? Um, how, uh, how did the political system interact with that particular actor and how did it, uh, well, develop this kind of immune reaction uh, to, to a person in a very similar position as Trump is now? So 
what I'm trying to say with these examples is whenever you characterize something, a particular country is rich or poor or successful, a particular system is fair or unequal or so, you're always doing this in relation to others. You have no idea how democratic or rich or fair the UK is if you don't employ the comparative method and you compare it to other things. So normally we make these comparisons either over space or over time. Um, meaning we either compare at the same point in time, we compare political systems, for example, around the world, or we compare over time, say we'll see how the uh, system in Britain has developed from the 19th century to today. Both, are, both employ the comparative method, they both have slightly different uh, goals maybe, and also imply slightly different methods. So um, anything, any one particular dimension that you might be interested in in politics, you might be interested in public policy, you might be interested in institutions, in political discourse, in the media, and so on, you cannot help but always think about this in relation to other uh, units in the same category. And that's why the comparative method is so important, because this, it acknowledges that we do this all the time anyway, but it's explicit about it. Um, I stole this from the University of Zurich here. Uh, this is one way, for example, you can think about the field of comparative politics along these different dimensions. Don't worry, you don't have to, you don't have to be able to read every single detail, but you can see, for example, that there's a way to think about, well, uh, comparing systems across space, right? You can, for example, think about how proportional systems differ from majoritarian systems, how they come about, how that's different, what outputs they have, how that is different, and so on. So this would be an analysis across space, uh, but mostly at the same time. Or you can think about, for example, things in politics developing over time from, say, the 19th century to today, and you'll see that there's for example, if we think about party formation, of course, that hasn't been constant. The way that parties are formed today or live and die today is not the same as it was in the 19th century. Um, so these comparisons over time help us understand what are the sort of general driving factors that explain, for example, party formation uh, or party position. So um, I'm going to give you a couple of more things that the comparative uh, method can do. One of them, for example, the, the one that you're probably most familiar with is that it allows us to describe things accurately and precisely. Um, here's, for example, a little graph of how many people have uh, immigrated into the UK over the past, how much is it, 50 years or so. Now we see a red line, which means that people are coming in. There's a blue line, people are going out. And we see, oh, okay, well, that red line is decently above the blue line. but uh, do we have any idea what this means? Well, we can play our game and we can ask, well, in relation to what? So in other words, these numbers are nice, and if we see, for example, that in 2015 there was around 620,000 people that came into the UK, yeah, but what does that mean? Does the UK get a lot or not so much immigration? We have no idea until we add a bigger picture and we compare across space. So here I've, I've given you the OECD countries, and we've gone away from the absolute numbers. So what does 620,000 even mean? Well, if we put this into relative numbers, the immigrants that are coming in as a percentage of the population that's already there, we get a pretty good picture of, well, who gets a lot of immigrants compared to the population and who really doesn't. And then we see that as regardless of how large that number might seem to us, 650,000 in one year, um, we'll still see that, of course, the UK is very comfortably in the middle of all OECD countries, even slightly below average in terms of how many people are coming into this country. Far, far behind, by the way, a couple of the countries on the right side of the scale that tend to have about three times as much, as much immigration compared to their own population. So, in other words, to describe like what immigration means in the context of the UK, we already have to employ some form of the comparative method because otherwise we have no idea how much there is and how much uh, it is in relation to others. Um, another um, thing that I always like to look at, I stole this shamelessly from Reddit, uh, where, someone, uh, went to the, where someone went to the trouble of actually going through the Wikipedia pages of all political systems in the world and made this lovely little uh, visualization of all the different voting systems that exist around the world. Uh, now again, we can't really accurately describe these sorts of things 
in a non-comparative way. Um, now, by the way, don't, I, I still haven't entirely gotten what this legend means down there and the points and all that, but what you can tell from the graph already is, of course, that there's a huge variation. Um, I mean, you're all aware that moat, there's a lot of countries that have some sort of first past the post kind of system. Once you get over a particular threshold, everything else is more or less discarded, which is how it is in the UK. And of course, there's another huge chunk of countries that have some form of a proportional system where kind of everyone gets a little bit of a share of the power or the seats depending on the share of their votes in the election. But what you can tell is from a good global comparison is that there's far more variation in here. Uh, including a couple of really exotic things. And luckily, we'll have a, we'll have a lecture to think about different um, electoral systems. Well, we will, for example, think about such beautiful things as the border count system, uh, which is really only employed in Nauru in the Pacific, um, and which is a very interesting uh, system where you rank different candidates partially based on how much you wouldn't want them as the leaders, and it can very well turn out in a system like that that a person gets elected that actually doesn't get a majority of votes or even the majority of first preferences from people. In a board account system, you normally tend to elect the person that's least offensive to the most people, which is something that's, I don't know, it, it just feels like such a nice way of going about things. Um, so anyway, again, you see that uh, only a comparison allows us to kind of accurately describe kind of the variation around the world uh, in terms of these uh, electoral systems. So uh, comparing systems uh, across time and across space allows us to identify characteristics. Uh, it allows us to say what is distinct about a particular political system, but also what it has in common with others. And we can classify types. So we can say, for example, here's another, I love doing maps if you haven't noticed already. Um, here's, a, here's a little map that I found online that um, looked about who in any one particular political system tends to deliver the televised Christmas message or the televised New Year's message. And there is quite an interesting trend here in that all the monarchies of Europe tend to have the monarch deliver the Christmas message and there not be a New Year's message necessarily, while the systems that don't have monarchies normally have a New Year's message, a secular New Year's message. And now we can think about why in the world does that happen, right? These are very different countries. I mean, this is like Belgium, Liechtenstein, the UK, Norway, like what do all these have in common? Spain even, what do all these have in common? Why is the monarch delivering the Christmas uh, address here? Despite us seeing other countries choosing other things in Europe. Well, I mean, we could all come up maybe with a more or less convincing explanation. My, uh, my hunch would maybe be that Christmas is considered sort of a religious holiday. And since some of the monarchs are normally tied up in the religious system, maybe sometimes even being the head of the church, not naming any countries, um, they normally tend to deliver the more religious Christmas message, while the more secular message of New Year's is left to the secular uh, uh, most senior power holder uh, in the country. So anyway, we can, we can uh, so you see uh, along a huge variety of dimensions, we can identify certain specific types, so we can think about what types we have here. We can, of course, also measure through comparison, and in a slide this is going to come back to us. We can also identify trends uh, across time and across space. So... Um, we also use the comparative method because it on, not only uh, allows us to accurately describe variation, but we also want to explain that variation, of course. We want to understand why are the one guys or the one uh, ladies delivering Christmas messages and the other uh, people are delivering New Year's messages, right? Why do society systems or institutions vary uh, across space and across time, and what are the things that explain certain patterns or trends or across space or over time. And the comparative method is really good for this because it allows us to test particular claims because we can control for other differences or similarities. So in other words, if we want to, for example, think about, well, does poverty breed uh, corruption or does corruption breed poverty? Both of the things we could make sort of a more or less educated argument for, right? We could say, well, corruption kind of drains a society of vital resources. The, the money, the resources don't go to the people that need them, and therefore you have poverty. So corruption comes first, then comes poverty. 
Or you could say, well, I mean, if a system is, if someone is already poor, maybe the only way that they can even get by on a regular basis is by using a corrupt system, either by paying someone off or by receiving uh, bribes, for example. So it might also be that countries that are already poor then breed uh, corruption over time. And of course, the comparative method allows us to take a really close look at that and maybe come up with a research design where we could test that. If we could find, for example, a number of systems, all of which are fairly poor, all of which uh, the countries, all of which are fairly poor, but some of them have high levels of corruption and other ones have low levels of corruption that already tells us, well, it can't just be due to poverty, right? Because otherwise, everyone who's poor would also have a problem with corruption. So the comparative method kind of allows us to control for certain other factors. And that's especially important in cases where you have very similar systems that have sometimes very different outcomes. Um, Western democracies are always interesting to look at because they're all fairly similar, they're all fairly prosperous, but oftentimes they choose uh, very different foreign policies in certain regards, and then we can think more systematically what leads to this. We can also use the comparative method to build theory, meaning we come up with sort of general stories about how the world works. Well, I think a parliamentary system always incentivizes the following behavior, and that's why all parliamentary systems will do a certain thing in a particular set of circumstances. So building theory doesn't mean, uh, mean simply we build general stories about how the world works. We're gonna have illustrations of that on Thursday too. The, uh, um, another important thing that the comparative method gives us is it allows us to simplify things. So um, we can abstract and compress time and space and we can maybe focus on only particular elements of political systems rather than everything. So if we say like, well, look, let's compare the UK and Denmark, we probably don't have to compare every single aspect of a political system. Maybe we can just focus on particular ruling parties and compare those. That simplifies things a lot. Or if you compare countries that are already fairly similar, I don't know, uh, uh, Austria, Germany, Italy, Spain, I mean, obviously they have their differences, but they're still at times very similar systems. Um, it allows you to simplify things and not having to look at all the differences, all the similarities, but only at a particular set of them. And it also uh, allows us to quantify and measure, of course. If we um, uh, think about, again, uh, majoritarian systems, for example, we can then compare different majoritarian systems and we have easy measurements available that allow us to distinguish between those in terms of, well, how majoritarian are they? Are there differences there? And what are the different outcomes that these systems produce? So it allows us to simplify things by um, kind of subtracting away things that are similar anyway, and maybe focusing, for example, on the things that are different between any two or more particular cases. We can also evaluate, and this is something that we do all the time, and that's becoming really, really, really important uh, in the field itself and also in practice, because, um, of course, we need to compare to come up with a good idea of, as I said uh, a couple of minutes ago, which countries are actually successful or prosperous or fair or equal and so on, or the reverse, which countries are actually doing poorly in terms of poverty reduction or democratic access or fairness or gender equality and so on. We have to compare. We can't do this in single case studies because again, in relation to what? We don't know. Um, so uh, only a comparison allows us to collect the sort of broad ranging data and the statistics that we need to make these kinds of evaluations. Um, now, obviously, there's always a bit of, we should always be a little skeptical about this, of course, because reducing everything down to data sometimes means that we might not be making very meaningful comparisons. Um, and of course, there's lots and lots of discussions about particular ways to compare countries mostly on very simple measurements that um, have received criticism. One of the ways, for example, you can think about the world is you can arrange every single country in the world on one particular axis, and then you call that axis, for example, the Fragile State Index, uh, the FSI. This used to be the Failed States Index, and then someone pointed out that, hey, excuse me, not everyone on this scale is failed or about to fail, so maybe you want to choose a different word. So then they came up with the Fragile State Index. And what this does is, for example, it looks at four different um, dimensions, 
it looks at state cohesion, at the economy, at the political system, at the social system, and again has a variety of other variables in those particular indicators. Long story short, it comes up with one number. You as a state get one number that supposedly shows, and I'm only saying supposedly because I want to reinforce the notion of skepticism, not that this is a bad measurement, but supposedly uh, it means I can tell you in one number uh, how fragile your state is. And you can see, by the way, that there's a good bit of variation across the world, maybe even variation in places you weren't expecting variation to be found in. So you can see, for example, that not all of Europe is dark blue. Uh, parts of Europe are indeed uh, quite green, uh, or even light green, which means uh, this is already at the bottom end of stable. Uh, and of course, this is, if you look at who is light green here, this seems to be mostly because certain economic indicators seem to be depressing that index. Even though if you look, to, uh, if you look at any news report from Paris uh, this month, uh, you might notice that maybe there's a reason why, that, uh, why the country is only dark green and not dark blue, because clearly, well, stability is under a certain threat there uh, currently. So um, you see there's a, there's a huge degree of variation in there, but also, of course, we need to always ask ourselves, um, is this too reductionist? Like, obviously, this tells us something about the world. It tells us, for example, where states tend to be fragile. It doesn't really tell us all that much of why they are fragile, for example. So unless you know the subscores, for example, you don't know if a country is yellow because it's doing great on every indicator, it's just a bit poor, or uh, if it's doing uh, medium well across all indicators. You have no idea. So these statistics are important, but they can also be reductionist. They can lead us to conclusions maybe that we can't immediately draw from the data. And of course, if you are a state that is like at the alert level, you're probably not all that happy to get that published in the first place. So maybe you'd rather that people don't compare your country to others. Uh, another way to think about evaluation is, of course, something you've all heard, right? The PISA scores are an exercise in comparative, in using the comparative method. This time to only look at one slice maybe of the, well, let's be generous political system in the sense that uh, the political system, of course, in most countries is in charge of the education system. And we can see, for example, that in countries that are all, for example, economically doing rather well, we still see pretty huge differences in terms of educational outcomes. Now, again, we can discuss, of course, A, how these scores are made. We can discuss how meaningful they are. But what we certainly see from this is that there's variation. So whatever they test, there's different things coming out across countries that might be very similar in certain other regards. And of course, we have to point out that with the comparative method, we can go even deeper. We can, for example, look at the fact that the scores in the UK are not uniform across its national subdivisions. We see, for example, that particular parts of the country are doing better on these evaluations than others. And we also see that um, if there is a, that some regions of the country experience a fall while others are not. So again, evaluation is an important thing that works uh, on the basis of the comparative method. We can also exercise governance through this. And now we're coming back to my point at the beginning where I said, well, sometimes comparative politics, the comparative method can even lead us to make real life change. Um, well, think about how we are sometimes trying to influence behavior through comparison. It's really simple. Hey, our people are poor. They're much richer on the other side of the border. We should probably change our politics so that we can be the same way. Um, or uh, we are doing really well here. Across the border are all these poor people that are waiting. They just want to come in and take your jobs. So clearly, that's not a good idea. That wouldn't work without the comparative method, would it? So um, there's, an, there's an aspect of comparing territories or countries that then might lead to changes in governance. Uh, so I get, I've given you another example at the top right here. Uh, once we've developed a good measurement of how much CO2 states are putting out, maybe this leads to us believing that particular countries have to make particular sized contributions to solving this problem. In this case, for example, it's pretty interesting to see that um, if you tally up the CO2 emissions over the past 150 or so years, you get a ranking, for example, that is slightly bit, a slight bit dissimilar, maybe, from rankings that you get if you only look at today, 
And why this is interesting, of course, is that there are some countries that are saying, well, we shouldn't be held to the same standards as Western countries because we're still developing and you can't expect us to go straight more or less from, oh my God, our people are starving to we need to buy solar collectors. There need to be intermediate stages that we can't just skip. Um, and of course, uh, indicators, measurements, and comparing a country can also lead to a significant degree of pressure on the national level. There might be people inside your country that are pressuring the government because they feel that compared to others, for example, the government is doing quite poorly on some measurement. But we have to keep in mind, of course, that there, can, there might be able, we might reach a point where not everything can be compared. So we can't just use comparison for absolutely everything. That's what's meant by comparison gone crazy. Uh, I like this little cartoon here. This is a league table of the most effective league tables. Um, so just comparing itself doesn't necessarily give us all the answers. It has to be one uh, weapon in our arsenal. 